time now for another edition of the Weekly Word with Professor Stephen Hines and myself, Jason Spies. This week, we're being joined by Siri Nadu with Tocqueville Asset Management. When it's time to put the booze down. Over the past few months, I've told you about how unbelievable hatch coaching is. Don't just take my word for it. Listen to what Christy Huber, president of the United Way of Cass Clay, says about hatch coaching. I think it's a really exciting time for our young leaders today because um, leaders like Eric Hatch are changing the face of what it means to lead an organization or what it means to lead a brand. He's changing that. For many years, I think that the, the gold standard of leadership has been somebody who is very polished and has it all together or seemingly has it all together And throughout the years. Um, I think that we've now, especially with technology and social media, we are drawn to what's real. To find out more about Hatch Coaching or to have Eric Hatch speak at your event or company, visit HatchCoaching.com. That's HatchCoaching.com. Or call 701-212-1572. That's 701-212-1572. Based in New York, outstanding. Of course, we have Professor Stephen Hines with us as well. And this is the weekly word, a little bit of a conversation that I like to uh, you know, have every single week. It's a, it's a higher level conversation. We were just talking before we went on the air here that uh, a lot of times this turns into a high level discussion where we might use current uh, events as examples to really talk about the layered discussion that we have. And, uh, um, you know, that's kind of uh, setting the table a little bit too early. But uh, uh, Professor Hines, how, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. Uh Actually, it's winter in Wisconsin, as you know. <laughs> they even have winter out in New York. Isn't that right, Siri? We do. We do. Uh, anyway, I'd, rather it, have Siri, I'd rather have Siri sort of start, uh, you know, t- carving out some of his uh, interest because he's an analyst, and uh, at the end of the day, he is responsible to people who give him their money. So uh, his his number one job is helping people preserve assets and make money. So I'd rather have him go through uh, in the energy sector exactly what he's what he covers and and uh, his view of it and situation right now, right after the uh, snowstorms in New York. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, it's 30 degrees over here, and it, after what we've been through, it feels downright balmy, actually. <laughs> you know how your body adjusts to the, you know, single digits and then it's good and you say wow it feels good so it was a pleasant uh, stroll to work today so anyways you know i've listened to some of your shows and i'm you know i i totally get your enthusiasm about, you know uh, on the shales and what it represents in terms of american freedom entrepreneurism innovation and it's, you know, and we all know, yeah, it's just the layers of how it's benefited this country, layers and layers to, to geopolitics is amazing. So it's amazing to see that, you know, we see success, the same things, uh, you know, same sort of features, uh, aspects of this country succeed in Silicon Valley, you know, where, you know where uh, wireless uh, technology in the U.S. was considered dead, you know, 15 years ago, you know, because Europe went GSM, and then you see uh, the free-for-all over here kind of just, you know, uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, going back to Hindu sh- Shivaism, sort of, sort of die and then resurrect so you know well the same thing in the in the in the in the in the, in, in the oil industry and in, in gas industry the shales where the u.s has been shrinking as a producer as we all know had been shrinking for decades and uh you know grizzled uh, sort of uh, old timers like me uh, you know, that looked at the industry you know basically we were, we were, the industry was investors were primarily populated like value value players because you're a shrinking industry you bought net asset value so who industry in a shrinking industry consolidates and you know we would try and find what the next consolidating consolidating might be etc etc 
and valuations were kind of low, and then you know, and then this growth thing happened. It's just amazing. It's been, and you've talked, uh, you know, a lot about all the layers of how it's benefited us from the industrial base, cost of energy, for the whole country, geopolitics, manufacturing base, and it's been the job job creator for the last decade. Exactly. You know that's one of, that, that's one of the things I wanted to ask, ask you about. I wrote down four things that um, I, I wanted to bring up uh, based on what what you talked about. The first one was the job creator, uh, Stephen Hine, uh, not Stephen Hine. Sorry about that, Professor um, Stephen Moore. He's a he, he's a economist and he's on Fox News at times, and um, I, I forget his. Uh, organization he's with, but uh, Stephen Moore, he's a pretty well-known economist. He's he's spoken a few times at the uh, Petroleum Council annual meetings, and a couple years ago, he had an incredible stat, which was that uh, Texas and North Dakota were the only two states that actually you know made money during that like decade-long recession, and and um, North Dakota actually. And Texas took care of the other 48 states during during the the downturn, sort of so to speak, in the economy. And the other thing that he mentioned on there was that the oil industry, after a decade, was the only one that had a net gain of jobs. Meaning, all the other startups and all the other industries, after a decade, lost jobs. And the oil and gas industry that told that told me a lot. Have, have you come across any stats like that or any? anecdotal uh, examples to kind of either validate what Stephen Moore was talking about or either maybe take it a different direction than what he's talking about? No, I mean, I've, uh, you know, uh, I, I know that uh, just anecdotal things, uh, just the kind of things you mentioned that uh, the, 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 uh, the oil and gas industry has been sort of struck was during the downturn was sort of a mainstay was 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 the job you know was the job creator um and and we know that it's benefited this country you know if, in terms of just having lower price for uh energy for you to uh, for you for uh, for electricity it benefits everybody Things like that, so it's it's helped, and uh, I'm not. This is not my area, you know, the macro jobs and things like that, and so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't talk spend much time on that. But what I would uh, sort of I, I what I can talk about, what I enjoy talking about, is how this industry, as it sort of as you have. Uh, you know, as you have uh, the production, the transportation of the production, the the benefit it has to the uh, to the uh, to the chemical companies down on the coastline, to the refiners, where natural gas is an input, where the, you know, in, in refining and 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 low natural gas prices benefit them, and where more importantly. You know the uh, uh, surge in production in the United States has allowed you know all kinds of discounted slates over here. So you know, so we as investors look at this whole stream and 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 have you know and have enjoyed making investments all along the stream among producers, the people that provide services to them, the transportation companies down to the refiners and to the chemical companies. So as investors, we've had a lot of fun with this. So this is the sort of, you know, this is my sort of, uh, we look at the so you, we know what's going on in terms of the industry, and our, our perch, our perspective is how can we make money? And basically we look at this whole stream and try and, Try and find areas where you know where 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 we can where we can make money on behalf of our clients. So that's basically my sort of you know perch. And and uh, as you and I were talking uh, yesterday, sir, that uh, yeah. one area that you had mentioned <clears throat> that you didn't know much about. Again, I think as you put it, you were skeptical about. Uh, the shale revolution, and certainly in a you know out of the way place like North Dakota. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I, 
I would, yeah, I would turn the tables a little bit and ask Jason questions because, you know, as as a value guy, the, the, as Jason, as you know, the uh, the Bakken was the first oil shale that went good, that 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 that, that got started. And you know Brigham, Brigham, and oh, what are what are the names over there? Uh, there was one name with a, with a little company with like something like a bear or something like that. I forget. A various bunch of companies over there. And as I started, uh, you know, as a value investor, we were just I was just caught flat-footed when growth started happening and. And for the first sort of tranche of the shale of oil growth, shale oil growth, which is the Bakken, I stood on the sidelines, and I just, and I, I just because I, I wasn't a believer. It took me a while. You know, it's been decades of looking at, 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 the, at the at production shrink in this country. So when growth happened, you know, uh, as I pointed out before, the, the, the industry was populated by value investors, and as growth happened, we were skeptical and. Uh, Oh, I was skeptical, and 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 for and I stood up the Barkin, sort of you know sides on the sideline during the Barkin first few years, and as a consequence, I have never really known the Barkin well, or known the players, or really invested in it, and I and uh, and and it remains kind of a. Uh, sort of a black spot in my in in in, in my understanding of the business. So, uh, so uh, Jason's question to you: What it, it, I believe the Bakken is started is is growing again, albeit at a slow pace. And what do you you know? What is the health of the Bakken? Where you know at what prices? I mean, today's prices just about any of the shales can function well. Uh, but where you know? But just you know. Six months ago, prices were in the you know were below fifty. And where is the break even of the, in the Bakken? And, and uh, we are invested in some companies that are actually have been selling the Bakken assets so that they can double down in in the Permian, which I know very well. So, uh, so Jason, where do you think the Bakken stands right now? You're so close to everybody in the Bakken, and uh, you know what is the mood? Is it uh, sort of, uh, is it careful growth? I mean, the industry as a whole is being somewhat careful. The rig count hasn't, hasn't um, matched. In, in recent weeks, the rig, the rig count hasn't matched the upturn in prices. But, you know, but we're turning the, pay, the budget page of the year. So we'll see what the expectations on rig count are for 18. We don't know that yet. But what is the mood in the bargain right now? Well, the mood is mixed, of course. I mean, there's uh, for the oil companies, it's uh, no different than farming, really, at the end of the day. And there's break, break-even prices depend on where you are, geography. Um, yeah, and so, you know, the good news is, this is what I was telling people the last couple of years, is the good news is at $30, we're still drilling 900,000 to a million barrels a day. And ten years ago, we were doing thirty thousand barrels. So they've they've figured out a way to reduce the cost. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they're making money. You know this that once the momentum stops on the work crews and a lot of these rigs, it ain't that easy to get it going again. I mean, it it takes that takes time and money. So they'll they'll do break evens they might even lose a little bit just in order to you know come on the flip side of things the flip side of things i remember talking to james volker uh whiting petroleum two years ago in may so it had been two mays ago at the uh, williston petroleum council uh and i'm sorry the williston basin uh, uh meeting they have in uh, bismarck every two years the uh, it's in canada uh, the alternate years and he said at that time it was about they made about $28 million on a well, and they had got the cost down to like $8 million. So they were making, you know, a good $20 bucks on each well. So they were producing some good numbers. That's why they don't mind breaking even, and they don't, you know, mind even losing a little bit on some wells if the prices get around $50, 60 70 bucks. They're back in, you know, in, into some good days again. They're also doing some refracking. And that is doing a very good job of uh, being a supplement. It's being a, another arrow in their quiver of uh, oil-producing activities. And, you know, North Dakota is a little bit different because 
We've had core samples. Now, this is not true with Montana. You know, we're, we're, so we're back with uh, Siri Nadu, Professor Stephen Hines, a uh, little technical snafu. So we're back at it. The question posed was, is the Bakken going to make any money this year? And, you know, that, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a great question. I wish I had my crystal ball. But there's some reports that the production is going to kind of have a lag, and so it's going to come down a little bit. But on the flip side, you've got the governor now issuing a challenge for 2 million barrels a day. And he's met with the oil companies, and so the state is putting the infrastructure in place and really working with the oil companies so that they can achieve that 2 million barrel a day goal. And, you know, that's in the next year or two that they want to hit that. Now, is that achievable? Well, they're putting the plan in place. Now, a lot of this is price-based. I understand that. But one of the things that Lynn Helms, uh, who is the uh, director for the North Dakota Department of Mineral Resources, 99.99% of the information that comes out of the state comes out of his office. And um, one of the things him and I keep talking about is, do we got to look at rig counts differently? Meaning that the rig count numbers is not the most effective way to look at the projection of an oil field anymore. So uh, there I threw a couple things at you guys there. One is if you want to talk about the rig count and if we need to reinvent and relook at that, that's a whole different discussion. But at the same time, uh, the governor is looking at trying to create an environment so the Bakken can produce 2 million barrels a day. I don't know if that answered your question, Siren, or not, but there you go. Well, no, no, it's clearly not the rig count because it's, it's really footage fact, you know, is, is what you what you need to look at. Because yep. that's that's you know, that's exactly what you're producing, what you frack and, and you know, with the 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 the, 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 the uh the laterals have doubled and then we're going two miles, sometimes three miles now in in laterals. So it's the 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 number of wells is not the key. It's really footage fact. The question is can the Bakken sort of the US is is generally considered to uh, the expectations right now overall is uh, is for the U.S. to grow, depending on commodity prices, of course. But you know, uh, in a ba- uh, around a band of of about a million barrels, okay, for the next two three years, and uh, and uh, broadly speaking, the Permian is expected to contribute eighty percent of that. About eighty percent of that. So you know. So right now, the expectations of the Bakken are not that high. You know, the expectations are broadly speaking a flattish or up. You know, single digits. So the two million barrels that, which would represent a doubling, is uh, is considered would be considered by investors. Uh, you know, depending on the, uh, over the next four or five years, highly unlikely. I mean, the, the investors generally think that that the Bach, you know, the, the Bakken is not as uh, you know as efficient a resource as 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 as, as a lot of what you have in the Permian. Of course, there's some in the bar, some of these areas of the Bakken, as as you were pointing out, Jason, you know, is better than others, and so. Uh, so you know, if if we have much higher oil prices, of course, you know, broader part of the bar can get can get going. So that the general view of investors right now would say is the bar is going to be sort of, uh, you know, mid single digits. You know, as long as you know oil prices don't grow, as long as oil, oil prices don't go through the roof or go through the floor. So I would say that that's the perspective. I don't know what, whether you you know. You, you, Talking to the uh, CEO that you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you know, you, you you found recently a, a you know a more uh, more enthusiasm or not? You know, I don't know. As you know, companies like Continental have you know have increased, which is uh, which is you know which uh, if it's a company that's been associated with the market more than any, it's Continental. And uh, as you know, Continental's putting a lot of resources down and. In the uh, mid continent, in the uh, scoop and stack plays, etc., down in Oklahoma. So, uh, so and, you know, so I was just trying to sense if the recent uh, uh, higher prices for the commodity has, you know, has 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 energized, uh, has has brought a little more energy to the players there. 
You know, I think uh, a lot of um, it's again, it's mixed. You know, you've got a, kind of a slow and steady deal that's happening, and um, you know, you mentioned Continental um, looking at some other plays, and they have. I, I interviewed uh, several people from Continental about the scoop and the stack, and talked to even some of the people at Whiting. Whiting is looking at getting into other shale plays as well. They acquired Oasis. Oasis is now looking at, you know, other parts of, uh, I want to say it was at the Delaware Basin, I think is what, what I saw. So, I mean, I, I, I get that. Um, N- North Dakota would be one of those safe stocks, in my opinion. Here's why. Um, when we made the news before, it was because it was $100 oil. And again, we have the private mineral rights and we have the Laird Library. So the um, drilling cores have been done since 1950. So the oil companies know exactly where every piece of oil is. And as they go back in with the refracts, that's how they're able to get such great production numbers is because since the 50s, we've kept a core library. So all those geologists and scientists, they, they, they know this stuff. So that's why, I mean, it's like farming now. It's like it's like a straight commodity price deal. And um, where North Dakota comes in is they have the research, and they're making a lot of money on the research. The Energy Environmental Research Center, the energy companies are putting a lot of money in there. They're doing things with uh, coal. They're doing things with natural gas. And that's really where the investments pay off is that long term because there's little micro booms happening out there in coal. In natural gas, One Oak just announced $1.4 billion of an investment into the uh, Bakken for natural gas. Um, the, yeah, I mean, so un- until they can really start making money on the natural gas side of things, there's been rumors for five, 10 years about big natural gas cracker type plants coming in there. And it's never come to fruition because the natural gas money isn't there. But when you've got nine different kinds of gases versus Texas's three, the oil companies love that, but they just need to figure out how to make money on that. So there's little micro pockets. That's what I mean. Like as the technology increases, there's going to be uh, a steady investment because really the Bakken has figured out how to make money in both the bull and the bear market. And that is one thing that does make it special. I agree with you. It's a steady, it's a steady ship. It's a, it's a pretty steady ship. I agree with you. They, they, well, know the, they know the resource that does well at lower prices, and they know what they can turn on at high prices or more. The, but it's the band is is, is 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 you know is fairly is fairly uh, it's fairly steady. It's not a very wide band, so it's it's a steady ship. I, I think I agree with you. Well, and, and the other thing is that uh, like uh, like the Permian and the Marcellus, uh, this whole notion of the industrial internet. Uh, better known as the Internet of Things. I think you're seeing uh, an upgrade and how almost every step of the way they have better evaluation tools. So I, I think, uh, but there's one other factor we haven't talked about, and that are there's, those are the wild cards. What will happen in West Virginia right now? China has pro- promised $84 billion. Lord knows, uh, don't cast a check yet. But there is an enormous amount of talk inside of the uh, West Virginia government right now because they have some they have some legal issues to deal with. They have some uh, old fashioned laws that say that if one person of uh, of a group of people who own land doesn't want to sell, they don't have to sell. So, so they have to make it more of a uh, economic activity than sort of I, I don't know what Appalachian, uh, but. Uh, they're about to sort of explode in their own way. Ohio has yet really to do much work uh, on their well, own research. And, of course, we're, uh, and the big one, uh, of course, New York. <laughs> right. Well, New York, forget about it. <laughs> That's the overhang, you know, over this discussion right now. And uh, we're tracking, because I track pretty closely with that debate going on out about Delaware and I have some friends who are going to testify on behalf of the health aspects that are being overblown and uh, and the community in, influence factor that's being under under uh, discussed. But it's really almost down to how much good education we get out there right now, to tell you the truth, Siri. Well, I'd say don't hold your breath. Don't hold your breath on New York, but New York State. But, uh, you know, the, uh, Shell, is, uh, Shell is, I believe, a go 
uh, on a crack uh, in, uh, in in uh, Ohio, I believe, or Pennsylvania, yeah. close to Pittsburgh. That's a go. That's a go. That will take some years, but that's a go. Twenty twenty two, I believe. And uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of NGLs uh, in West Virginia. There's a lot of NGL, you know. Uh, there's a lot of NGL in the stream, in, in the ga- in, in the wells in West Virginia. It's very, very NGL rich. So a cracker there might make sense, but you know. So, and so if you know if, if somebody wants to come in and put a cracker there, that 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 that, that, that could happen. Um, the, the, we don't need. We don't. We don't. We, I mean, the industry really doesn't need money from outside. It, the industry's healthy and economic on its own, especially the crackers. Uh, the uh, 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 the first iteration of 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 the shales, the Chinese, the, the Total, uh, uh, and uh, and Shell in 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 the Bakken, they all got their. Uh, and they all got the, well. Shell finally ended up buying Brigham, I think. So that 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 ended up okay, probably. Uh, but uh, the first iteration, all the foreign companies that came in, even some Indian companies, they all got then. Uh, you know, they all got bloody noses. <laughs> so uh, we really don't. And the industry is very healthy without them. So one, the industry doesn't need this uh, foreign capital, and two. Uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 uh, foreign capital is <laughs> after their first experience they're a little more leery, but still I, I think they gonna I, I think they might come back, but it's it's not gonna mean you know whether things ha- whether this revolution continues or not that it's not gonna change that. Well, now is it also that. true? Isn't it also true that uh, that the the gas industry has matured and now. Uh, they're being asked by Wall Street and other lenders, uh, you've got to live on your cash flow. Yeah. I mean, well, so that's, you know, it's, that's, that's a very interesting discussion because the, uh, uh, because the, 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 back, the, 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 the background is that the, uh, the, 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 the uh, oil and gas companies, the E&Ps, the service companies, and the pipelines have have been poor performers in the stock market in 2017. They performed, they, you know, they, they, they were, all these groups were down for the year. And as you know, the index was, uh, S&P was up 22% total return. So they've been, you know, on a relative basis, particularly vast out underperformers. And they really didn't, uh, and we've had, uh, particularly in the second half of the year of 17, we had, you know, we had more constructive prices, you know, quite constructive prices, I, I would think, given, you know, relatively speaking, what, relative to what we've had over the last two, three years. And uh, so there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, 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 conjecture as to what, as to the implications of uh, 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 stocks underperforming, and it's—I I would say—it's a mix of uh, you know, and it's it's reported widely as Wall Street telling the industry to spend within cash flow and 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 and, and, and grow responsibly so that you don't wreck you know the whole price scheme in the world again etc cetera, etc cetera. it's been it's, it's reported as that and there's some of that but uh, but it's really the stocks underperforming and then people trying to really find reasons why it did why they did so so uh, so you know and there could be other reasons such as the indexes were doing so well you know uh, uh, so why you know so, so in some uh, so so people just I think some investors look tired of of you know of of of, of investing in, in this industry that might be a factor too but but so right now the 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 the, the the uh, theme that people uh, carry is that Wall Street has told the industry to go responsibly and the industry is responding. But I take that with a big, I still take that with a big grain of salt. Because, as we all know, the industry has historically, 
you know, always kind of, you know, outspend its capital. And, uh, and uh, I think we might be in a different path, slightly different path. At least that's what I'm hearing from the companies. But still, you know, I reserve, I, 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 I reserve final judgment on this. And, and and a lot of this is on this talk of why exactly the industry is underperformed and what it means. It's, it's you know a, a lot of this is as I said is 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 I think conjecture right now. But right well, right now, and so we will see the plans. We will see the budgets for eighteen, and that will tell us a lot. That will tell us quite a bit. Well, one thing is sure. Good. One thing is sure is if. Your stock prices, you know, if for for the industry leaders such as the pipeline companies, the uh, the service companies, and the ENPs, if your stock prices are not doing well, it does mean something to them. It it might not be Wall Street telling them or whatever it is, but if your stock price is not doing well, you do behave a little differently. And uh, you know, uh, yeah. So 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 there will be some different behavior, but. That's going back to what I said before I take this with a grain of salt. If the stock prices, on the other hand, start performing well, the industry might just go back to some of their old habits. So that's, again, you know, and, and, and grow and grow and try and, you know, push the pedal on, on, on growth. Hey, I got a question for you here. Um, uh, Siri Nadu with us, as well as Professor Stephen Hines. You mentioned something about the stock price, so I had to jump in, and, um, and we can get back to. Uh, talking about the oil and gas. Um, but I think this is actually pretty important because I've said this for a couple of years now, being embedded in the oil and gas industry is public relations and image and ensuring that education is done to the average citizen really is important to the stock price. D- do you find any credence behind that statement or do you disagree with that? Oh, I, told, I mean, I, I think the industry's done a horrible job, horrible job, you know, uh, educating the country in how important it has been to the country. You know, uh, Aubrey McClendon, you know, I mean, he was, he, he, before he died, he was, you know, he he was one of the proponents saying, we need to sell ourselves, you know, better. And as we've talked about at the start of the show, the, the industry's been, um, you know, the, the industry's benefited this country in an amazing number of layers, you know, from lower uh, electric, le- electricity prices for everybody that ended that, you know, from the consumer to the manufacturer benefits them, balance of payments, uh, you know, and then uh, uh, manufacturing uh, renaissance, uh, uh, exporting oil, exporting uh, surging exports and refined products. You know, uh, we've got the best steel, refining steel in the world. Well, and and the, you know, on the Gulf Coast, and they have a chance to really show their colors. Right, we're exporting, we're, ex- we're exporting uh, propane to China to to to, to the chemical. Uh, you know, so it's it's been amazing and. Not to, not to forget about you know undercut and the geopolitical, you know balance of payments, geopolitical considerations, you know undercutting, you know what could be a stronger Russia, you know they had, and, uh, and 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 you know and being able to deal with the Middle East a little more dispassionately, you know you know we're not over a barrel anymore, you know, so it's amazing. Industry has not sold that message. Just yeah, not you know, know that message. Uh, you know, uh, really, that's really what Jason and I sort of, we, I guess that's what brought us together, because we both agree. Jason's a great, he, he, one of the things he's best at is humanizing uh, uh, the story and, and bringing it home and making it, making people aware of the community uh, benefits and, you know, sort of boots on the ground uh, uh, from, in, from the inside out. And I'm more of a, I'm more of an activist kind of guy, but I, I, I look at what's, what's been done. For example, now I don't mean to pick on GE. Uh, GE at one time owned 10% of the company I helped go public, if you remember that far back. But uh, anyway, uh, so we, I dealt with GE, you know, well up the food chain, renewables and things like that. But somehow they got lost. They started out with eco-imagination in 2003, and they never used it. 
they have missed, you know, 15 years of opportunities to highlight what they're doing through their customers. How can you do that? You tell the world how many, uh, you know, how many greenhouse gases have been reduced. What is it? What's that right. effect? Uh, you know, the old-fashioned stuff. Oh, the lead since led led the world, and as you've talked about, in you know carbon reduction. <laughs> and, and it was because of you know it, it was not because of policy; it was because uh, as a result of American innovation, the shale gas. Well, so you know, uh, you know. I mean, that's, and, and hurting our competitiveness as far. I mean, the rest of the world is catching up as far as paying wages. So that part is sort of taking care of itself. But the truth is, we have been able to cut significantly into our cost of goods. You know, yes. from the, you know, from the steel mills on down. Yes. Yes. And, That's and, actually and is, you know, in some pockets back. Why isn't anybody talking about that? It, it, there are so many gaps in what you know what the media is talking about. The last program we had. Uh, sharing, uh, uh, we were talking about the national media, and I said, no, it's the National Enquirer. You know, they have really you become, right. you know, the Post and the Times, they really have, even the sports section is politicized. You know? It was, I, I think, talking, you know, there's about, uh, I think, uh, Exxon's got two and announced a third cracker. Uh, uh, Dow has uh, uh, Dow has a couple, I think, involved in the couple, uh, and there's others. So there's you know there's at least half a dozen that are just uh, uh, ethylene crackers to take advantage of NGLs, cheap NGLs crackers. Three billion dollar plants have been are being built, so we can make ethylene, which is the uh, you know the base ingredient for most plastics. Now these you know, these these crackers. I think before that, before the, this 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 uh, this uh, series of crackers, there was I don't think any any had been built in the United States for about thirty years. That's so it's you know it's hard. something like that. Yeah. So uh, it, yeah, so it's 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 been huge. Well, I wanted to ask you about the uh, Davis Refinery. Now that is being built in North Dakota, and it's the first. Uh, full-on refinery in 50 years being built in the United States. North Dakota built a diesel refinery, the uh, Prairie Refinery, uh, a couple of years ago, and then it, uh, the original investors then sold it to, I believe, to Soro after the oil prices dropped. But uh, th that was a diesel only, and so this Davis refinery is going to be the first uh, full-on refinery in the last 50 years, and it's it's going to be next to or close to a national park. So they're being extra under the microscope on all of the emissions technology and et cetera, et cetera. I got two questions for you, Siri Nadu, and what? Tesora? Oh, who's building? Is it Tesora? Uh, it's it's actually the uh, it's the Meridian Energy Group, and what they they it's a local it's a local family outside of Belfield, North Dakota, and um, they they have the land and this and that, and they're working with the Meridian Energy Group. It's a bunch of energy professionals got together, I guess, kind of created a new company, if you will. They all have experience. I I, I don't want to speak out of school for the Meridian Energy, but uh, I believe they're you know within the last five years. Uh, our company, but they're they've got wealth of experience. But as Jerry, I know that there's so little capacity over there that there's you know there's there's, there's a lot of opportunity. So somebody's taking the you know to, uh, to taking the bull by the horn and going. Do you know how big the? Uh, how, I doubt it's a very large refinery, but do you know what the capacity? I don't know, like fifty thousand barrels a day, Jason. Yeah, okay, but so that that would be considered a mini mini one. Relatively mini. That, that's the size of most uh, most ref many refineries. You know, uh, from fifty to about 100, 110, 20 in the so-called uh, in Pad Four, as they call it, the Mountain States. You know, that that's Pad Four. Whereas the refineries down in Pad Pad Three, down on the Gulf Coast, are you know the, most of them are you know many of them are five hundred thousand. You know, right. four hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay. Okay, here's here's kind of what it is. It's a 55,000 barrel per day crude oil refinery and they're going to they're going to employ 200 permanent full 
time people. And there is, a, I think, an anaconda, um, anacorda, sorry, anaconda, anacorda study done by Washington State about that refinery up there. And what they found is that for every job that gets produced by a refinery, uh, it has a has a 12 ripple. So the 200 jobs, they're, they're expecting 2,400 new jobs to, you know, a community that, uh, well, honestly, the county doesn't even have 1,000 people. And so they're going to actually go to Dickinson, North Dakota, about 23 miles away, and that's where the primary um, people are going to live. I, I would imagine where the services are because it's on the interstate, and you know, they, they, I suppose there's probably fifteen thousand and people in that town. So they, you know, they've got more uh, civilization than Belfield, who during the oil boom they went they went bankrupt in the eighties. So they didn't they didn't accept any growth at all. So like I don't even think they grew one person during the uh, big oil shale boom, and that's where a lot of the activity is. So much so they're building a refinery out there. But yeah, it's uh, fifty five thousand barrels a day. From an investor standpoint, what does that mean to you? That that size fits. My hats off to them. I mean, refining jobs are well paying jobs and steady. So you know, so it's a steady, you know, it, 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 it's 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 that's that's a great uh, uh, that's a great you know uh, 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 burst of positive energy to the industry to the community. Let me ask you this though, Syrian. Let me ask you this. Hang on, uh, Stephen. Uh, one second, Syrian. From an investor standpoint, when you hear you know uh, there's a refinery coming into the Bakken, and what, what does that mean to you as an investor? You know, I'm, I don't. I'm not holding your. You know, I won't hold you accountable to it, but just kind of you know hearing that. What does that mean as an investor? Oh, it, it, it makes sense. I mean, the the the, uh, the, the, refine, the refining companies I know that have uh, assets in uh, Wyoming or you know in, in those areas, you know, they're, they're often fifty thousand type uh, 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 structures, uh, and uh, and or sometimes it, it's closer to a metropolitan area like oh i forget the city uh maybe salt lake city or something like that you know or somewhere uh, 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 or near denver actually uh you know you can get up to 100 120 or so so uh there's there's margin opportunities for 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 these uh, refiners uh, you know they have advantage. You know they they, they basically arbitrage. They, they, they can get advantage slates of crude. You know, and uh, often they get. Historically, many of them took advantage of uh, proximity to Canada and and uh, geared their uh, geared their uh, 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 geared their process to. To uh, take advantage of you know Canadian heavies and which are you know as you know traded a discount steep discount, um, but things are changing a bit. We're producing a lot of sweet sweet crudes, so so this might be a more simple refine in the context of of uh, of uh, of where we sit. You know it's. It's a very, it's it's you know it's 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 a very small, uh, it's a, it's it's a, it's it's a, it's a very small asset, you know. So it doesn't mean much for the. It just it's it 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 tells us more about it. Un, it, it confirms that there's opportunities to make money in areas that have been neglected. Uh, well, and, the and they went from, it went from three hundred thousand people five or six years ago to five hundred thousand. Uh, they have been a no growth, you know, a stunted little state for more than more than uh, too long for their own good. But all of a sudden, you, there's an optimism there, which is, I think, what uh, being, being the Jason, I, you know, I, I've been going up there for the last three years, and I, I've really bought into the story. But I suppose it's much more uh, economic. It isn't sort of. Uh, uh, global or international news, but in some ways there are star parts of the story about North Dakota that deserve to be told to the rest of the country. For example, watching Iowa, I mean Ohio and Pennsylvania play this chicken, you know, chicken game of chicken between the environmentalists and 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 private sector. I mean, it's it's honestly from one day to another. Uh, I mean, it, it will affect all kinds of things, of course. But you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, uh, one of the stories I told during uh, last week, I think it was, that uh, I, I read a lot. I, I have 45 uh, Gmail alerts every day. So everything on emissions in the world, for example, or 
or shale, I get. I, and I can re- at least read through and see whether I want to read it or not off the wires. But uh, NRDC was calling on some of their people out in the uh, Delaware Basin because they're having hearings coming up. They said uh, to their group out there, we want you to do better presentations. We want you to wear costumes. Ha! Now, okay. think about that a second. I mean, you know, it really has almost become a beauty contest. And I think, you know, from my point of view, and I believe this is the same of Jason, in some ways, we want we want to highlight the Bach and why, because it went, it came from a long way back and it's really become a progressive state and they are forward-looking right now. Uh, right. And they but, get getting going, back, going back to the business of it, I mean, when you have, uh, you know, resource creation, you have, you have, the, the, the other things happen too, like, the, like before you mentioned earlier that Onyok is building a pipeline there, right? So you have yes. infrastructure coming. Now you, now this is another extension of that. Now you have a, refi- a refining asset, probably the first. It, it's uh, going back, Jason. Going back to your question, what is probably uh, uh, the significance of this? If there is one, right? It's a small asset, so from an economic point of view, there's very little significance. But the significance, of, if there is one, is I think it might be the first refinery in new refinery in this country. In maybe thirty to fifty years, I don't thirty years, thirty years at least, because the U.S. we continue to build, expand our refining capacity, and and more importantly, we 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 increasingly we we continue to to fine tune and invest in our refining capacity so we can more efficiently uh, uh, you know the process. Of, uh, different uh, uh, other ty- uh, varying types of slates but in terms of but all this activity has so far centered on existing refining iron that uh, that has existed for 30 years plus and so this and there's been no sort of new uh, greenfield refinery during I think in the last 30 years at least so I think the significance of this is it's, it's, if, if you can at, at least you know it, it's it's uh, it's a sort of a conceptual significance it's it's uh, it, it's it's I think the first greenfield refinery uh, in, in at least 30 years and, and remember this is a zero emission this is going to be state of the art this is the kind of refinery that can be built in other parts of the world and be used as a blueprint I mean, in some way, you know, again, that some of that has value, some doesn't. Uh, to me... Oh, uh, we don't have to do that. We don't need to do I, that. I'm the, the, the Chinese and the Indians have been, you know, building new refineries uh, for quite a while now. And, and you know... What about and, Africa, you know. then? Is Africa... I mean, Africa is a case all by itself, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I tell you, I, I'd like to just, uh, before we wrap up here, um, I'm kind of looking at the clock here, uh, Siri Nadu, uh, Professor Stephen Hines. Uh, I did want to ask you about uh, Lynn Helms, I uh, mentioned him earlier, Director for the North Dakota Department of Mineral Resources, uh, interviewed him uh, a few months ago, and he did bring up, uh, we, we did talk about how the Bakken was not as uh, sexy or advantageous or as inviting as uh, the other shale plays right now. It's, it's lost its competitive edge, if you will, in attracting investors. Um, what, from your perspective as, as someone who deals with a lot of investors in oil and gas, and you've pretty much validated what what Mr. Helm said is that the, the interest is kind of weaned a little bit from the Bakken. What has to happen out in the Bakken for more interest or more investment dollars to come back in there? Well, I mean, it's it's the rock, you know, it's the rock. The Bakken is, uh, you know, the, 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 the rock is, 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 is um, I'm no Bakken expert, but it's, the thickness is about 50 feet or so. You know, I think it varies, but it's about fifty feet or so. In the Permian, you've got you've got uh, you know five thousand plus feet some places of of, of productive rock, five thousand plus feet. You know, also you know, and so you've got that's why in the Permian you've got uh, you've got uh, um, that's why in the Bakken you've had uh, for, for, you know Bakken was the first to really really you know, extend the laterals. Because when you have thin rock, what you do, you just you know go sideways as far as you can. 
but uh, in the Permian where you have, you know, uh, you have sometimes because of the 5,000 feet of productive pay, it allows you from, uh, depending on where you are, from, you know, two, three layers to maybe seven layers of, of productive rock, right? So it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to, to compete. But on the other hand, the Permian has all kinds of, because all the rig growth that's happened so far has gone in the Permian. Right now, the Permian is suffering from, you know, from, from, uh, from, you know, from, as you would country. expect, logistical issues. The Bakken, because of its steady state kind of uh, 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 level of activity, costs have remained low. This Permian has some quite a, you know, some pressures, particularly in pumping right now. There's, you know, we, we're running out of pumping capacity very quickly over there. So, uh, don't have to import Wisconsin sand down anymore. Oh, maybe, maybe. I think I think it's they're still doing it. Uh, it's early stages of sourcing uh, uh, local sand. Early stages, and we'll we'll know whether you know it's it it, it really satisfies everybody. But uh, and it might, it might. We'll see. But yeah, uh, it's early stages, right? I want, right. I live so, from Wisconsin, so I want you know we want the revenue. Come on, Deering. <laughs> Who knew Wisconsin? Was, Wisconsin was a beach at one point. I guess it was it was an ocean and a beach or something like that to have such good sand. What? Ha yes, and uh, uh, there is the two ice ages. The second one's name is the Wisconsin Ice Age, and what it okay. did, it, it brought down a bunch of fine sand down the middle of the state and went down about 150 miles. So there is this remarkable patch of sand that was left by the second ice age. Okay. Who knew? Anyway, <laughs> have you ever been out to Wisconsin? I sure have. I sure have. I used to love to spend time in, uh, at the, uh, what, what do you call that cafeteria? At, uh, on the lake at, at, at University, uh, in Madison. Oh, the terrace, the terrace. Or, or, the terrace, yeah. I, I spent a couple summers hanging out on the terrace. Uh, Way back. I was just there last summer, guys. I was just up on the Mona, the Mona Terrace overlooking the lake in Madison, Wisconsin. I was just there last summer. <laughs> Still nice. I, I, my, my, the time I was there was 30 years ago, so I don't know if it's still that. But it was fun then. <laughs> and it's still fun. Uh, just a few last thoughts, and, and uh, Siri, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, Absolutely, my my pleasure and fun. My, part of what I'm doing right now, uh, you know, in some ways, I'm I'm trying to look at uh, things that uh, this country needs to learn, uh, and I think and uh, I think we uh, that America has to look at things more like a utility commissioner than they ever have before. They have to understand there's a price for everything. And yeah. uh, we got here by, we have the, the most sophisticated grid in the world. We don't have to take it apart to make it better. Uh, all we have to do is be willing to allow some of it to be replaced with new technology and then add it where we need it. It's not that complex. Right. One thing, um, one thing we should do is, I mean, the shale should sell themselves better like we talked before. And h having listened to one of your previous broadcasts, I, I, there's a point where I disagree with you, which is I do not think it should be called unconventional. I think it should be called shale, and we should be proud of it. And okay, we should yeah, tell I'm why we should be proud of it. We shouldn't be hiding behind some sort of uh, some sort of a more obtuse word, unconventional. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get rid of fracking here. That's all. You know? I, no, I think I think fracking is good too. Fracking yeah. is fine. You know, well, let's let's you know uh, you know. Yeah. I use it. It's fine. I, I know it's been used as a, it, it, it's used as a bad word, but we should turn that around. Well, that's. I, I think that's 
Jason and I are still trying to do right now. We think we shouldn't hide behind anything. We don't need to. It's something to be proud of. Very. Proud See, Siri, I totally agree with you. In fact, that's one of the things that I always I brag about. In fact, it's in my business model. Is I don't get into the politics of oil and gas. I don't get into it. We there's so much innovation going on. There is so much economic data. There is so much job growth and an actual what I call good news because it's it's factual and it's not it's not leaning in a political manner all it is is this is what's going on and this is how it's going to impact your life because we're talking about energy here folks we're talking about mining we're talking about real life we're not talking about whether somebody wants to use a bathroom in a gender way because that 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 and you know what and honestly oil and gas doesn't care about that they they don't actually share a lot of those prejudices so it's really it's really um what my biggest issue with oil and gas right now is what i my challenge is is so much of the resources are going to the politicization of things that I think it's having a uh, counter effect on the industry. That's why I asked you about the the PR earlier, because I've noticed how politicized you mentioned earlier. uh, I think it was Professor Hines mentioned about how the sports page is politicized. Now, I do not think you need to have right to life discussions and gun control discussions when you're trying to have a factual, intelligent conversation about oil and gas. What do you guys make of that conversation I just had or that that topic I just said? Well, I, I, what I would I, what I would say is that you know this this industry you know I mean what's important is it underlines what's what's the most important thing for me is underlines two key things entrepreneurism and innovation. This is what this country is about. This is what, and that's what we should focus on. This is what and the, and the benefits that have come out of that. And so that's what you know. That's what I would you know I would underline. Three times. <laughs> I, yeah. I, 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 I toast you right now, Siri. Siri, I laugh because I, I I I bring this up all the time that my first story I did back in 2012 when I got hooked on the shale boom, and it only took me 30 seconds because of the entrepreneur opportunities and the innovation. I mean, I looked around and I saw how many pizza joints were needed and how many haircut places were needed because there was 10,000 cars going down a road every five minutes. But what what my first story was, was the shovels and picks of the Bakken, meaning Back in the old gold boom days, and you know this, it was the people selling the shovels and picks that made the money. It wasn't the gold people. They made money, sure, but the guys selling the jeans and the picks and everything made the real money. So that was my first story. My second story, which I'm still revisiting on a weekly basis, in fact, I do a segment called Groundbreakers. It's called, This is Not an Oil Boom. It's a technology boom, because really, that is what has been driving the growth of this industry. What do you make of that, Siren? And it's so American. That's the, 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 it, 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 I, what I'm trying to get back is it, it, it underlines you know certain core American values, and that's what we should we should be focusing on. It's you know, it's just not it's not techno, te- technology as a technocrat because there's technology all over. But what made there's shales in Argentina, there's shales in China, but why yeah. didn't the shales over here work? It's the kind of freedom of companies just going at it. And we've created advances unlike any other. Because well, of the system. The system. We, we need, this is what we need to focus on. The, 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 the system of entrepreneurism, innovation, you know, uh, the, 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 the free, uh, free enterprise. You know, this is what allowed things. Leonard Cohen has a song uh, back from the early 90s. And one of his lines goes, um, uh, democracy is coming to USA, uh, it's got the machinery for change. And I, I just, ha- I, I see no other country that has figured out a way to allow enough of the machinery to work by itself. Well, gentlemen, I think we're going to wrap her up here. So any final thoughts that uh, either anybody might have, if they want to plug their organization, their websites, or whatever final thoughts you might want to, you might want to go. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Siren Nadu. The uh, floor is yours, sir. Right. If you, you know, if you have any interest in, in, in my organization, it's Tocqueville 
asset management. Uh, our, our website is Tocqueville.com. Our funds are Tocquevillefunds.com. And, uh, you know, and you can find uh, lots of good information on us uh, through that. Thank you. And mutual funds and, and individual investors, right? It's oh, absolutely. 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 High net institutional and, uh, and mutual funds. Well, thanks for joining us, Siri. Uh, this is uh, Steve Hines uh, signing off. This has been delightful. I, I can tell it would be... Uh, Terry and I talked a bit yesterday, and uh, uh, I knew it was going to be good today. So thanks for joining us, Siri. To listen to the full-length interview with Siri Nadu of Tocqueville Management, along with Professor Hines and myself, Jason Spies, visit thecrudelife.com. That's thecrudelife.com. Of course, all these interviews are available on YouTube and Facebook Watch as well. Check out The Crude Life's Facebook page as well as our Twitter account and other social media. Check out thecrudelife.com for all the appropriate links. Once again, that was Siri Nadu with Tocqueville Asset Management, Professor Stephen Hines, and myself, Jason Spies, would like to thank you for joining us this week on The Weekly Word. The music on today's program is written and performed by the Moody River Band. To find out more about the Moody River Band or their music, visit our website, thecrudelife.com, and click on the Musician tab. That's thecrudelife.com, and click on the Musicians tab. Now we're gonna have no trouble with the treble. There's no breaks in the breeze. It's just you and me and baby. Yeah, we're singing it like they did in the good old days Because we're back to the way Back to the way